Last week I said something about the fact that we are, uh, as, we, as we study that all of the feasts of Israel, all the festivals of Israel, we, we, this last one, uh, the last uh, festival is the festival of tabernacles, okay? And we, uh, as we studied it together, we, we ran across a verse that, um, that hinted that something else is coming. And that's where we're at today. Uh, there is a there is an, uh, an encouragement found in those verses for us, and it and it is on the fact that there is a an eighth day. Well, you and I both know that He told them to, to worship together and to, and to dwell in tabernacles and booths for seven days. But then He said on the eighth day, and so we've got to go see what that eighth day is. So. Uh, as we as we look at our Bibles together, we look on the screen and, and see what's there. There is a, uh, I'm going to read Revelation 21, 22 through 27, and uh, I'm going to give you a little hint about what that eighth day is going to contain, okay? And Revelation 21, 22 through 27 says, I saw no temple in the city, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. And the city has no, has no need of sun or moon, for the glory of, the, of God illuminates the city, and the Lamb is its light. The nations will walk in, the, in its light, and the kings of the world will enter the city in all their glory. Its gates will never be closed at the end of the day, because there is, is no night there. And all the nations will, will bring their glory and honor into the city. Nothing evil will be allowed to enter, nor anyone who practices shameful idolatry and dis dishonesty. And all those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life, those are the ones that are going to be in the city. So let's just let's just go to the Lord in prayer and say, Lord, we'll be there someday. Heavenly Father, we ask you to be glorified. We ask you to be the one who is uh, who is glorified in all of all of what we say and do and as we study and as we think, Lord, let us be uh, governed by the Holy Spirit of God to know what things there are that we are, uh, that is still yet ahead of us, something that, that ought to excite us, something that ought to make us to, to, uh, to get ready for the end as it comes, that we would not uh, shun it or be fearful of it. But rather that we would realize that, Lord, in that uh, hidden coming is a, a glorious day. And then we ask you to be the one who is controlling our lives and our thoughts today so that we may worship you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so we talked about the tabernacles and we talked about what it is. And he, he told them, he said that all of God's people would come together and they would dwell in booths. And he says it, believe it or not, three times in that set of verses that he says they'll dwell in booths. They'll dwell in booths. And, and we talked about the fact that there's several things that is, that is uh, done during the tabernacles that we will, um, that, that they saw in those days. While they were, while they were pouring the water of life, uh, the, water, the living water out, Jesus stood and said that he was the living water. And as they saw the glory of God that he stood and he claimed that glory and, and as we and, and as, so in a little bit of a review there we see that there that uh, the Israelites were to dwell in booths and to remember their days in the wilderness as they as they wandered in the wilderness that they lived in booths that they lived in temporary housing and uh, and they so the people in Sukkot they were given this instruction to build these huts and that they they wouldn't even protect them from the elements because that the, they have nothing in our own rights we have nothing but what god does for us is incredible and so he they were to dwell in them they were to rejoice during that time that their messiah would one day tabernacle with them they were to, they were to see that what we see in john 1 14 when it says in the word Jesus, in other words, became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. That word dwelt in that verse means that if, when you look it up, it
in his tabernacle. That Jesus came and tabernacled with us. So they are looking forward to their Messiah tabernacling with them. And we see that he's already come. He's already come and, and dwelt among us and tabernacled among us. And so we are given this instruction to remember this. And then, and then they were to also rejoice that in eternity one of these days that their God would eternally tabernacle with them. And the, the festival was to be held for this seven days, remembering these things. And of course, we went over all of this last week, what, what all was involved in that. But it says that he, there was a description of how to celebrate Sukkot. And it says, it said that on the eighth day would be a, a, a holy assembly. And then, you know, then we, we see that there's not seven days to worship, but eight. And so, what is that? I know that the scriptures don't uh, lie, and they don't make mistakes, and there's nothing in the scriptures that is, that is in error. So, what is that eighth day? Well, I just got this, this wild idea, that, and I think it's correct, is, is that we have, it ought to focus our minds on the fact that we are coming to a time very soon when we will have a special eighth day a special reminder that it's not just about the completion. You remember, seventh month, the, se the seventh, and they were to, to worship for seven days, and that all implies uh, a completion of all of that. So we have the whole story of Jesus through the festivals, and all of them line up and give us, through them all, the entire plan of salvation. And then he springs this eighth day on us, and so we ought to worship God for the fact that there's more coming. It's not, we're not done yet. And so, you know, the, the special hidden clue is, is that there's a, a final day of tabernacles, a day that is special to us. And he says, we know that God is going to tabernacle with us in man, with, with mankind in heaven. In other words, that eighth day implies that heaven is eternal. It just keeps going. The, and, and so let's look at some of the things about that. Revelation 21, 3, we've already read it. But he says, And I heard a, a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place or tabernacle of God is with men. Now this is future to us yet still. This is a look at the, the New Jerusalem. It's a, new, a look at heaven. And he says that God will dwell with us and tabernacle with us there. Uh, and the tabernacle of God is with men. He will dwell, there you go again, is the word tabernacle, with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be them as their God. So he is telling us that this is not all there is to worry about here on this earth. This, this, this uh, matter of fact, in, in, uh, in Matthew chapter 6, he says, don't worry about today because it has enough worries of its own. Don't, don't as Christians, don't get into the habit of starting to stress over this world around us. Listen, there isn't any politician out there that can straighten this out. I got news for you. If you, if you, you get a hint, any politician I know, you can tell if they're lying to you because their lips move. Okay? And if you just imagine that, you can kind of keep them in line. Okay? But the thing is, is that I'm looking forward to a time when eternally it's going to be okay. Right now, we have a kind of a view of the world of the pandemic and the, and, and the economy falling apart and, and this going wrong and that going wrong and it's too dry and the cattle prices aren't where we would like to see them and, and you just go on and on and on. I got news for you. It's going to remain that way until it gets worse. And then it's going to get worse until all of a sudden it gets better. Okay, and that getting better is what we're talking about today. There's a day coming. Here's who, here's who is going to be involved. It's hidden in that verse right there. It says that he will dwell with them and they will be his people. There's only one set of people in this world that is truly the people of God. And that is those who have accepted the, 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 the Messiah as their Savior and allowed themselves to be able to claim him because of confessing their sins to God and allowing the blood of Jesus Christ to forgive their sins, then they are changed into this people who are going to dwell with God forever. Now, don't, don't, get, don't get 
get too discouraged here. I've had people come to me, and as a matter of fact, I taught a Sunday school class one time. I wasn't going to say who, but I'm not going to mention names. But I had a Sunday school class one time, a junior high Sunday school class. And in this Sunday school class, we were talking about heaven. And this one boy come on, and he, he, he came back at me, and he says, Now, who in the world would want to live, go to heaven and just spend an eternity sitting on a cloud playing a harp? <laughs> Nobody. Nobody would want to be that bored, okay? Now, Lance, your guitar playing, I bet at the house could go on and on and on and on. You could, you could just, you did. And, but me? Now, if they had to listen to me for the rest of eternity, uh, they'd be the first murderer in heaven, okay, <laughs> would, would be that. So that's not what, there is nothing boring about this story called eternity. Heaven is going to be an exciting place. Heaven is going to be a place that is, that is wonderful. It's a, the most amazing adventure ever. So when we look at this in, in Revelation 21, 1 through 3, we see, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Boy, that ought to tell you something there immediately. A new heaven and a new earth. Why? Because the old heaven and the old earth has disappeared. And the sea was also gone. A world without oceans? That's, that's physically impossible for our world to be maintained without oceans. But isn't that what he says? He says, and, and, and he said, and he says, and I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, Look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them, and they will be his people. God Himself will be with them. So, what do we have to what do we have to look forward to in heaven? What do we have to look forward to as as we look at this eight day promise that there's much more involved than just the the completion of this earth? Well, the first thing we see is that the old earth, or the old heaven, and the old earth are going to be destroyed. They're going to be taken. The one you live on now. Now I've read theologians argue about this all through my all through my uh, career as a, if you want to call it that my calling, uh, and I've heard them say, "Oh, it's not what it really means. That it's going to be just changed, and it's going to be uh, the, the earth is just going to be kind of kind of cleansed and changed and whatnot." I, I, I I'm going to read this, and I, I beg you to get just out of this. When he says, 2 Peter 3.10, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done in it will all be exposed. I, I, I have a hard time getting that somehow he's just going to kind of cleanse the the earth and it's and it's going to be reused. I, what I see here is it says as as it says in in Revelation twenty and verse eleven. And by the way, the scene that it's at here is the great white throne judgment. And if you think of the great white throne judgment being the judgment of all the lost of all the ages, and they are standing and they're answering to God for their lack of the, uh, of belief in the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And it's us who are literally as saved people there, but just witnessing it. Okay. Now, I've I've heard of preachers all my life try to scare people into into being hated by saying, okay, and they'll be able to point a finger at you and say, how come you didn't tell me? I reject that because the only judgment I'm going to go through is not going to be from man. The only judgment I'm going to go through is the judgment seat of Christ, and he's going to hang whatever reward on me that I gain. He's not, it's not about, when you look at the, the judgment seat of Christ, it, it, it was not about a judgment of are you going to heaven or are you not. It's called the Bema seat judgment. And to put it into, into understanding for you, the Bema seat was in the middle of a, well, if you think of the, a track running or like we run track, only in the Olympics they had a seat in the middle, a raised dais, and at the end of the race they all gathered around that 
dais. It's called the bema seat, and they uh, and they hand it out from that exalted position. They hand it out whatever crown they deserve. Okay, a crown of leaves. Okay, and what, however they ended up that race. Okay, so it's all about reward. It's not about judgment for what you did wrong. So don't be scared, people, about the, the judgment seat of Christ. It's going to be, do this, and, and he says, he says, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. That was the instruction to give to Christians. It's not about you losing it and going to hell. You're not going to do that. So what is this? Well, the, the, the great white throne judgment is just the opposite. The books are going to be open, and he's going to, the, they're going to, he's, is their name written there? And he's, the angel that is in charge of this is going to say no. There is no name here in the book of life. And he says, depart from me. I never knew you. Okay? That's going to be a sad, sad thing. We're going to be there. But it's in this setting while this happens that I'm reading this. And he said, during this, evidently, while we are there, I saw a great white throne and him that seated on it. And from his presence, the earth and sky fled away, and there was no place found for them. <clears throat> Doesn't sound like it's being cleansed to me. It sounds like it's being kaboom, and it's gone. The old heaven, our heaven, <coughs> the old earth, our earth today, is going to be gone. You say, well, where are we going to be? You're going to be there at the, at the, at the at judgment. At the great white throne judgment, watching while this happens. Okay, so now we got no home to go home to. <coughs> Wasn't our home anyway, people. My home is in heaven. My home is with God, and this earth is nothing more than a place to sojourn. It's a place to for us to do the best we can while we can, doing for God what we can, and then we're going to go on and, and be home. Okay. So when you look at these and then look at that, then we have to have something that brings in this Revelation 21, 5 and 6. We, we run into this set of verses. He says, uh, what, what was 1 and 2? What did it say? And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Not the same thing. It's not going to be just one heaven and nothing else. It's a new heaven and a new earth. Important. Because we're going to come back to that, okay? 5 and 6 says, and I saw, and, uh, I'm sorry, and the one sitting on the throne said, look, I am making everything new. Everything is going to be made new. And, he, and then he said to me, write this down, for what I'm telling you is trustworthy and true. And he also said to me, he said, it is finished. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. All to all who are thirsty, I will give freely from the springs of the water of life. What did we study last week? What is the water of life? What is the living water? Jesus. Okay, so we have him there too, all right? The new heaven and the new earth will be recreated just like the original earth, and it, it'll be full, complete, ready for us to explore. And to enjoy in its fullness. Can I give you a hint? Go back and study Genesis. Go back and look at what the earth was like in its original. God's going to reset it back to Eden. And it's going to be an earth-sized Eden. And I think it was then too. But it's going to be uh, perfect. It's no... Can you imagine this? No goat heads? Oh, yeah. Yeah, is that good enough right there? I could almost stop preaching right there. No weeds. You plant seed in the ground and it comes up. There's a new thought in my head. You don't dust it in and wonder if you're going to get your insurance check or not. That's what that's what everybody here does. Okay. So so it's all it's everything everything works the way it's supposed to. By the way, if I understand what science I understand, and I look back at creation science, it's a very, very important thing to understand that it was that it was a, a, a greenhouse type of an atmosphere around the earth. It was perfect. There wasn't 
there wasn't a lot of radiation and, and everything. Every time I'd go out and forget to put stuff on my ears, I'd lose the tops of my ears. The reason that is is because you don't have that protective layer that was in the original earth. It's, gone, it's fallen. It's called a flood. Every bit of it fell. It melted and come down to the earth and flooded the earth. Okay, I won't get into that. All right, let's go on. But the thing is, is I, there's science behind all of this, folks. There is, if I were to just sit here for an hour and tell you the science behind creation, I can, we can go, we could go the whole time you want to sit here and then I could just keep going while you guys went home. But um, Revelation 21, 5 and 6 gives us an idea that, that there is this, he's going to create this all over again. Jesus is currently in heaven building each of us that place to tabernacle. That's what he said. He said, in my father's house are many mansions. Okay. I'm kind of old school when it comes to that word. He's, some of the, all of the, all of the new Bibles say rooms. I like the word mansions. I'm going to hang on to the word mansions. And I, I, you say, well, you may not deserve one. I know I don't deserve it. Every day people ask me when I'm, when I go to town or whatever, they say, well, how are you doing today? And I say, better than I deserve because I know what I deserve. I deserve hell. Mm -hmm. And Jesus Christ gave me life everlasting instead. I deserve nothing like what I'm going to get. So therefore, I might as well enjoy that mansion. You guys can believe in rooms all you want to. I believe that there's a mansion, you know, that mansion waiting for me. And, and, and in, and in uh, John 14, and, and, uh, and, and here it is. John 14, 2 and 3 he says, In my Father's house are many mansions. Oh, there it is. Okay. If it were not so, I would have told you I'd go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. How long did it take him to create the heavens and earth? What was the pattern? How many days? Seven. Seven. Six, six, six. It's six days he, 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 he labored, but then the seventh he rested, so I count the whole seven, don't you? Okay, but the, here's the thing. How long should it have taken him if he had done it? Nothing. Thought it, and it was all done. So the seven days are important because it's a pattern that we're supposed to see, okay? But here's the thing that we see. If it's been, took, if it's been that long since... Jesus Christ went back and ascended into heaven, Acts 111, then how much more wonderful is heaven going to be than what we have now? It's the total removal of death, sorrow, crying, and pain. Man, I like this verse. I like this verse a lot. Verse 3 and 4, he said, He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. You know, I just thought of this. The Bible says that God keeps every tear you have in a bottle. Your tears are important to Him because He knows that we shouldn't have had to live like that. This pain and this suffering and, the, and everything that we're going through now, this is all part of the curse of the earth. It has nothing to do with what we deserve except that because we are of mankind, therefore, when Adam sinned and the, he fell from the, that we've all fallen because we've all sinned. Okay, and so there, you know, Revelation twenty-one three and four, and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Neither will there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anywhere anymore, for the former things have passed away. So the first thing I can see about the eighth day is, is that it is a total reset of what God wanted it to be originally. The second thing that I see in here is that the New Jerusalem, uh, when we look at it, we see in Revelation 21, 9 through 21, a long bit of reading put up with me. He says, then, every, then one of the eight, seven angels who held the seven bowls containing the seven last plagues came and said to me, Come with me and I'll show you the bride. I like the fact that God, God allowed one of those angels pouring out all that junk on the earth. He got, he, one of them got to come and say, let me show you something cool. Let me show you something that's coming up for you. He says, come with me and I'll show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. 
And he says, he took me in the spirit to a great high mountain. And he showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. It shone with the glory of God and sparkled like a precious stone, like jasper, as clear as crystal. Can I stop for just a second and say this? This is not the new heaven, and it's not the new earth. This is something else. This is the new Jerusalem. This is the city of God that is coming down, and it's setting on the earth. When he says it's like a, a, a clear stone, a precious stone of jasper, clear as crystal, the best description I've ever heard is just think of a diamond. And not it isn't a diamond, but think of that clear, precious jewel coming out of heaven and, and residing on the earth. The city wall was broad and high with 12 gates guarded by 12 angels and the names of, of the 12 tribes of Israel were written on the gates and there were three gates on each side, east, north, south, and west. And the, the wall of the city had 12 foundation stones and on them were named, the, written the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. The angel who talked with me held in his hand a gold measuring stick with, to measure the city its gates and its wall. And he, when he measured it, he found that, that it was square, a cube, if you will, as wide as it is long. In, in fact, its length and its width and its height were each 1,400 miles. It sticks up 1,400 miles. It is 1,400 miles wide and it's 1,400 miles long. And it is of the brilliance of a diamond sitting there. And when he measured the walls, he found them to be 216 feet thick. According to the human standard that the angel was using, the wall was made of jasper and the city was pure gold, as clear as glass. Have you ever, I have a gold ring, is it clear? You know, this is a fake. This is something to remind us that heaven is coming. But the gold on the streets of heaven is transparent. The city is made of a transparent gold as clear as glass. The wall of the city was built on foundation stones inlaid with 12 precious stones. The first was jasper. The second was sapphire. I'm not going to go into what they all look like. Just imagine the most brilliant, beautiful stones <coughs> you could see. Okay, you, that you could imagine. The third was agate, the fourth was emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth was a car carnelian, the seventh was chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysopus, the, tw the eleventh J Jason, and the twelfth amethyst. And the twelve gates were all of pearls. Each gate from a single pearl. That's, um, and the gate in the main street was pure gold as clear as glass. Are you getting this picture in your mind? Only God can do this, is what it means. Only God can make something that beautiful. A lot of people want to say, oh yeah, yeah. That's that's it's just you know a pretty pretty speech. No, it's not. This is the future. What was the eighth day all about? It was about looking forward and seeing this is where we are going to be. The walls of transparent gold, the foundations of, of the 12 precious stones, the gates of 12 pearls. That's all what we have looking forward to being able to be there. Your, your duties are going to be to, to be on the earth during the millennium period that we are going to be uh, uh, ministers of the King of Kings. As, as Jesus sits on the throne, we are going to be active doing His bidding. Can I tell you this? Get ready. Whatever God has you learning to do here is probably what you're going to get to do the rest of the time. Okay? The rest of eternity, 
He's going to take the finest of what you are talented at and gifted at, and he's going to use it. And a lot of people tell me, oh, I don't know what that's going to be. I don't have no imagination. Mark it down. God knows what it is. You won't be bored. You'll be doing what delights your heart to the fullest degree. Just imagine that. You want to know what your gifts are, basically? Number one, just imagine what you do naturally whenever you gravitate to what you like to do. Number two, what people tell you you're good at. And what I think the third one was, I can't remember. Anyway, you get all of those and you just think of it just being natural. I was, I was telling Jimmy Gale earlier. But the, the whole thing when we get to looking at our lives, we are going to be doing what thrills our heart the most. What do you enjoy doing the most? That's what it was. And you add those three together and you kind of make a triangle out of it. And right in the middle is where your gift is. You're gifted to do something by the Holy Spirit of God. And when you get there, that's what you're going to be doing. So what about the temple? Are we going to have to have a temple in heaven? No. Revelation 21, 22 through 27 says, And I saw no temple in the city, for the, uh, the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. And the city has no need of sun or moon. For the glory of God illuminates the city, and the Lamb is its light. The nations will walk in its light, and the kingdom in the of, of kingdom kings of the world will enter the city in all their glory. Its gates will never be closed to the end of, at the end of the day because there is no night there. And all the nations will bring their glory and honor into the city. Nothing evil will be allowed to enter, and no one, not anyone, who practices shameful idolatry or dishonesty, but only those names that are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Those are going to be the ones that are there. So what do we come down to? Well, first of all, we see here there is no sun and moon because there's no need of light because we're going to be living with the light of the world. We're going to be living in, in that place where, the, where God's light permeates everything all around. And we're going to be bringing in a, if what a, the verses I read earlier said that we will bring our glory that we have in with it too. What is that? Well, because of the glory of God, he, he looked at us and he said that he is the light of the world. And then he looked at us and he said, you are the light of the world. Christian, you're going to bring part of that light in there. It's just going to be this, this great big place of, of, of wonder, okay? And the Almighty God and the Lamb of the Temple are the one, they are the temple of God. You're not going to need a building. You're going to have God Himself and the Lamb of God Himself. And you're going to <coughs> worship in that temple that is God Himself. And the Lamb's Book of Life, those of us that are written in that book, us, we're going to be there. Everything is going to be put back to the way God created it. Nothing evil ever again. I don't know how you said that. Man. This is what the eighth day, I think, represented. This is far better what's coming. What is, what is here now, we just have to suffer through it until death takes us. Or until the rapture takes us. But what is coming is an eternity of perfection with us. Matter of fact, the hint is seven is the number of perfection, of achievement, of, of, of fulfillment. If this is beyond that. This is beyond what we can imagine as being perfect. And so when we look at this, and I come back to one, one thing here... I see that last phrase, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And my heart stops right there and says, we're not done here on this earth yet. Because I can guarantee you not everyone's name is in that book. The duty of the church, the focus of the church should be evangelism. Yes, we have to put up with this world. Yes, there's all kinds of bad in this world. But what you have within you, each one of you as Christians, is you have an opportunity 
to teach others who Jesus Christ is. And God's going to lay them, remember, in your lap, in your sphere. He's going to put those people that, there that you can talk to, that you can encourage. People who come into your sphere ought to be told that there is hope, that there is wonder to come, that there is more than just this sad world. You want to know why right now suicide is so prevalent in the earth? It's because people have no hope. You carry within you the message of hope. Christians, you were put on this earth to not just take up 18 <coughs> inches of space on a few. This isn't what church is all about. To just come and sit. What it is, what it is about, is it's going to be each and every one have a ministry. A ministry to be able to teach and to preach and to lead others into a vision of hope and tell them that it's not about this world. It's about what's coming. And that's what we need to be doing. Don't go to church. Be the church. Do what God asks us to do. There are people around you all the time that you can reach on your level and that'll be enough for them. You don't have to be a preacher. You don't have to be a theologian. You don't have to be any of that. What you need to do is be open mouthed with what you do know. And tell them what, tell them what happened to you. And tell them what, what God has taught, taught you that is coming. And when they say, but I don't understand, teach me more. You say, I've got to learn myself. Let's learn together. That's the first is called evangelism. The second one is called discipleship. Everyone needs someone to disciple them along the way. And after that comes ministry. And after that comes fellowship. And after that comes worship together. It's See, there's a church has a, a job to do. And my fear is, are we doing it? So I think we ought to stop right there and we ought to just say, let's get busy. And let's just do what God has wanted us to do. And let's be evangelists. And let's be teachers. And let's be the one that can give hope to the people who have no hope. Because heaven is coming. One of these days it's going to be too late. And I don't want to focus on the negative. I want to focus on the fact that we still have time to tell one more person. So let's get